We're closing out the time of Jacob and Laban, and we saw last week how Laban had chased them down to supposedly say goodbye to his daughters and his grandchildren, but had that ulterior motive of finding the family gods that had disappeared from his house when Jacob and his family left. Uh, Rachel was the one who had stolen and concealed those family gods. And when her father came in to her, to, uh, to her tent, to search her tent, she uh, gave him an excuse that kept him away from where she was and where she was concealing them. So uh, as far as we know, Jacob and his family go back to Canaan carrying along that sign of family power, the, the ultimate sign of his family authority, the family gods. Now, before we get into tonight's text, <clears throat> I want to ask you a question. What do you call your God? Do you just use the generic term whenever you speak of God? Do you just call him God? And everybody knows who you're talking about. Uh, do you use the term Jehovah or Yahweh or the Lord? What kind of term do you use? Becky and I use a term that was kind of brought into Scripture by Abraham when he and Isaac are going toward the place where he's going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Isaac says, well, I see the fire and I see the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. And the, the Hebrew is Yahweh Yere, uh, God will provide. And that's our family motto has been as long as we've been together, and he always has. So the, uh, I think all of us associate to God perhaps in different ways, and so the thing that we call God, the name that we use to refer to God, may have some bearing on how we feel about God in the first place. So as we go through, we're going to start in chapter 31 and verse 36. We're going to see some different ways that Laban and Jacob refer to God. And sometimes, well, most of the time, they're talking about the same God, but they have different terms that they use because of their experience with who this God is. Uh, let me remind you that on the way to catching up with Jacob and his family, Laban had a vision. God, the God, our God, told him, don't mess with Jacob. Do not say anything to Jacob either for or against. Be kind to Jacob. And so he, when he catches up with Jacob, he lets him know, you know, your God told me that I have to be careful with the way that I deal with you. Right? Beginning in chapter 31 and verse 36. Jacob was angry and he took Laban to task. He said, what is my crime? Have I wronged you that you have hunted me down? Now that you have searched through all of my goods, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of your relatives and mine and let them judge between the two of us. I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and your goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself. You demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or by night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime. The cold consumed me at night. The sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks. You changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would surely have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. Okay? So uh, the God's rebuke refers back to chapter 31 and verse 24. But what was it like for Jacob to work for Uncle Laban? He gives him a pretty long list of negatives. Right? It wasn't 
a picnic, and we don't have all the information laid out for us as we go through, but here in retrospect, Jacob looks back and he says, all of these things you did to me in the last 20 years, you changed my wages 10 times. How do you trust a guy that just constantly changes the arrangement that he's made with you? The first thing that he does in an arrangement is say, if you work for me seven years, I'll give you my daughter Rachel, but instead he gives you Leah. And then he says, well, you can have Rachel, but you've got to work seven more years. And then he makes arrangements for him to stay another six years, another seven years. And during that time, he changes his wages ten different times. So when Jacob is making his plea, who is the innocent party as far as Jacob is concerned? Jacob is, right? You've treated me badly. I'm innocent in all of this. Now, we know that Jacob did some things to take the flocks away from Laban uh, with God's help to magnify Jacob and to put Laban farther and farther down. Uh, But as far as Jacob is concerned, he is innocent and God is on his side. And I want you to remember Abraham's statement to the kings of the plains when he had finished rescuing Lot, they said, here's what we want to do. We want you to take spoils and we'll pay you for what you've done. And Abraham said, I'll never take a penny from you because I want you to know that it's God who takes care of me. So Jacob has kind of the same thing going on here. You treated me badly, but my God took care of me in spite of all of that. So my God has rebuked you. And notice the names that he gives to God the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac. Isn't that an interesting name for God? The fear of Isaac. So he knows that his grandpa, Abraham, had God as his God. He had a covenant relationship with him. He knows that his daddy, Isaac, feared God. The fear of God. And now he has, he's beginning to have a relationship with God that's even independent of those two. So we've got the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac, and he'll use that phrase again. So verse 43, here's Laban's answer. Who do you think Laban is going to think is innocent? Laban's going to think Laban is innocent. So he answers Jacob, these women are my daughters. The children are my children. The flocks are my flocks. All you see is mine. Yet what can I do today? Because uh, what can I do today about these daughters of mine or about the children that they have born? Come now and let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. He said to his relatives, gather some stones. So they took some stones and piled them up in a heap, and they ate there beside the heap. Laban called the place Yegar Sahud. I practiced. Yegar Sahadutha, and Jacob called it Galead. I like Jacob's name better because I can say that one. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today, and that's why it was called Galead. Uh, It was also called Mizpah because he said, may the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. If you mistreat my daughters, or if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one else is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. So in Laban's mind, Laban is the innocent party, and Jacob is taking away his daughters and his grandchildren from him. They've lived with him all their lives. Uh, Some of them are in their teens now. Let's see, seven years, 20 years. Close to, anyway, probably better than 10, 11 years old. So here's all of his grandbabies, and they're all in the, the... on the way back to Canaan. So he sees that he has been taken advantage of and he sees all of those flocks. In the last seven years, his flocks have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. Jacob's flocks have gotten larger and larger and larger. And so he wants some kind of justice. When he first looks through all of the uh, area, Jacob says, I want justice Show me what you found that belongs to you. Bring it here in front of everybody. Right? Make sure everybody sees what you have found that I stole from you. Okay, He can't come up with anything. Laban's answer is, 
You've wronged me by taking my family away from you, and I think God will be my witness. And so they pile up a big pile of rocks, and they give it all kinds of different names that had meanings to them. Mainly it means uh, the witness heap, the pile of rocks that will be the witness between us. But they also call it Mizpah, and the reason they call it Mizpah is this blessing, or at least I thought it was a blessing, May the Lord keep watch between you and me while we are away from each other. If you mistreat my daughters, if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. So you've got Jacob's family on one side, you've got Laban and his bunch on the other side. And Laban says, we're going to put up this, in a sense, it's a witness In a sense, it's a barrier, it's a marker, so that when you get to this marker, it's going to remind you of this agreement that we have. When I was, oh, probably 12 or 13, and I don't remember who had the other half, whether it was a girlfriend or a guy friend, but anyway, we found in a shop a little heart, must have been a girlfriend, I'm going to go with girlfriend on this one, and it had inscribed on it, may the Lord watch between you and me while we are separated one from another. And I thought, isn't that the sweetest thing? You know, here's this beautiful sentiment of two people who care about each other and you you tore it in half uh, or you pulled it apart and it had a, a necklace with half of it, a necklace with half of it until you came back together like the Power Rangers or something and put them back together. That's not what Laban had in mind. There's nothing romantic about what Laban is saying here. What Laban is saying, the Lord's going to watch you while I can't watch you. May the Lord keep an eye on you and me while we're separated from one another is Laban's way of saying, I realize that I can't be where my daughters are, but if you mistreat my daughters, God will get you. So there's nothing romantic or sweet about the Mizpah benediction. It's actually kind of a threat that Laban uses to tell Jacob, that he needs to behave himself appropriately with his daughters and with his grandchildren. Now notice beginning in verse 51, Laban added, he also said to Jacob, here is this heap and here is this pillar I have set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, this pillar is a witness that I will not go past this heap to your side to harm you and that you will not go past this heap and pillar to my side to harm me. May the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So he calls on the right God, right? The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father. So when you go back into their history, their daddy's name was Terah. So Terah, we, we meet him early in I think the end of 11, the very beginning of 12. And these two young men are not equally connected to the God that Laban is talking about. Terah was not equally connected to the God that he's talking about. Abraham was obviously, he was called by God, he was led by God. There was a very special relationship with Abraham. But he calls on the God that Terah knew, the God that Haran knew, the God that Abraham knew to be a witness between he and Jacob. So Jacob takes an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac. The fear of his father Isaac. He offered a sacrifice there in the hill country and invited his relatives to a meal. After they had eaten, they spent the night there. And then early in the morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and gave them blessings. And he left and returned home. But you have this bittersweet kind of departing from each other. He has called Jacob into an oath that he will not mistreat his children and they have set up this line of demarcation. It's the demilitarized zone. When you get to here, you better remember that you promised you wouldn't come past this to hurt me. He's a little bit afraid of Jacob. He's seen what God does on behalf of Jacob. In the last seven years, a lot of his wealth has been funneled out 
to Jacob. You remember he, he told Jacob, I have figured out by divination. I figured out by my soothsaying, by checking with my gods, that you're the reason that I'm so wealthy. And then seven years later, he's figured out he's the reason that he's not so wealthy anymore and that God is on the side of Jacob. Jacob knows it. Laban knows it. God is taking care of Jacob. So Laban says, you've got to promise me that you're not going to come back and do me harm. And on, on the same page, I'll never raise my family in arms to come after you. And so that's the way they leave it. It's not... It's not a happy, joyous occasion. They sit down to a meal together and they spend the evening together and then it's basically just having to say goodbye. It's almost like one of those occasions where you know that the children are going to have to leave and so you spend the last little bit you can with them and you love up on them but you know they're not coming back. It's a horrible feeling, especially for Laban. But Jacob again comes out on top. Um, we've got a couple more minutes. Let's go on into 32. Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. So just reinforcing. Laban gets up in the morning and he kisses his grandbabies and he kisses his daughters and he just goes home. Jacob gets up in the morning and begins his journey and is immediately reminded of who he is. He meets the angels of God. Now, we don't know who these angels are. Well, we're not given names. We don't know if these are the angels that went down to Sodom and Gomorrah in Abraham's day. We don't know if these angels have a particular relationship. We don't know if they were some of the ones that were ascending and descending when he was on his way to Padanaram. We just know that as soon as Jacob leaves his meeting, he runs into angels. So you know that God is with Jacob and God is keeping an eye on the things that are in Jacob's best interest. Now, we'll throw a little teaser out there for next week. Lord willing, we'll talk about Jacob going home. Who's waiting at home? Esau. Esau. So... Jacob is not completely confident that things are going to go well when he gets back home and sees Esau again. But again, God will take care of all that needs to be taken care of.